Hi, I'm Kendra Abbott and I work at the Alabama Museum of Natural History. And the concept for this live bee exhibit actually started about two to three years ago when I first met Vince Wallace, who was then the president of the West Alabama Beekeepers Association. And we took a beekeeping class from him and uh, from the West Alabama Beekeeping Association. He was one of the instructors. and. Uh, we formed a friendship and then he showed us some of his live bees on top of Hotel Indigo uh, in downtown Tuscaloosa and um, he had expressed uh, thinking it would be really great to have a live beehive on campus and I was like yeah that would be really cool um, and so um, in September for this online um, Bama bug fest that we were having again this year we hatched an idea of actually putting a live beehive in the Alabama Museum of Natural History. So Vince then came out to the museum, we looked at a spot, um, and we had an idea. I had seen some live bee exhibits at other natural history museums, and he sent me what they wanted to um, create, and it looked very similar to what I've seen in other natural history museums. We emailed and communicated with other folks at other museums, and who have created these exhibits before and got their opinions and take on it, you know, what's best for the bees, what's best for the people. And then this um, observation hive was um, hatched. Mark Allison, who is a member of the West Alabama Beekeepers Association, generously volunteered uh, his master skills uh, in creating this observation hive. And Selena Bennett, who is the president of the West Alabama Beekeeping Association, stained the hive for us. We also wanted to educate people on the life cycle of a honeybee and a little bit of information about their natural history. That takes quite a long time and a lot of effort on, on lots of uh, folks' part. Put together a little infographic and sent it off to the print shop and so you can see here that the print shop is actually um, installing the graphic on the wall in the Natural History Museum so people can get an up-close and personal view of a, a honeybee in flight. When I taught a naturalist outreach course, which is basically a science communication course, a student did an outreach project and this is uh, part of Katherine Nordstrom's project here. She actually created a box that asked people to point out the honeybees. So even though she had pictures of honeybees all over in her outreach exhibit, uh, she noticed that people often couldn't identify a honeybee if they were um, scattered throughout bumblebees and wasps and that sort. So we will have uh, an exhibit that asks people to identify the honeybee for us. So here you can see I'm uh, putting everything together and creating more information on how to tell um, bees from flies, which is one of the most common, um, commonly misidentified um, groups of insects. One of the most important things about having a live beehive inside of a museum is how in the world are the bees going to get inside? So um, we had to cut a hole in glass, but the glass in the um, museum has um, energy saving gas inside there so that it doesn't get extra hot in the museum, which is good or cold. But um, so we had to have a Druid City glass come out and um, drill a hole in our perfectly good window so that the bees could then, so we could put a tube in there so that the bees could fly from outside and then in through the tube. Um, and into the hive to uh, show us how they make their honey. So after the hole um, in the window was created, uh, we then had to get the actual hive to the Natural History Museum. So we had to um, place the little garage, uh, that is what I call it. It's just a little platform with a little roof over it for the bees when they fly in to land on so that they can land and then um, kind of guard themselves from the weather and then walk themselves into the tube to get into the hive. And the biggest part of this was being able to bend that tubing specifically so that we weren't making the angle too much for the bees, but um, still uh, they were able to get to the bottom of the hive from the hole in the window. All of the 
modules were cleaned really well so that everyone can see the actual bees when they're buzzing around in there. And then the West Alabama Beekeepers Association wanted to do a dry run on um, placing all of the modules so they could work out any kinks as uh, without any live bees in them. Um, that way the next day when we had the live bees actually go in, we had everything worked out and uh, everything would go smoothly. So after years of planning and talking about a hive in the Natural History Museum, uh, the bees finally took a ride up the elevator to be introduced to their new home or hive uh, on the third floor of the Alabama Museum of Natural History. We're ready. We're, we are ready. We're just gonna she goes in first. Her. has to just get the metal there we go now push it all the way in look at that again pull the bottom first pull the bottom first. So after the bees uh, were placed in the observation hive, they you could hear them buzzing around at first because they were a little agitated after their uh, elevator ride, and um, but they quickly calmed down. And so then the question is, how is this hive designed to um, be a functional educational unit at the University of Alabama? We saw a video from Stony Brook mm -hmm. Nature preserve right and they uh, displayed this setup and so Vince got a set of uh, directions that wasn't a full set of drawings I wish it had been mm -hmm. I had to make my own uh, but uh, it gave us enough information to put it together and then I modified a few things I, I thought these needed to be a little beefier on the on this yep. uh, they they operated with kind of small material here and here and so I just upgraded to a little bit bigger stuff and uh, I guess the the heart of the operation is the modules each module yeah where uh, we have the ability to transfer bees without disassembling or uh, removing the whole uh, observation hive is what I'm familiar with that they would have to take it and remove the whole thing to deal with any part of it. Right. So, uh, what makes that possible is this concept of shims, these little metal uh, separators that makes it where we can slide those in and out and partition the different areas. Yeah so that the bees can't escape. In this morning, we loaded three of these and put the shims in place at Vince's farm. We prepared those and we were able to bring three modules of bees without any uh, stinging us in the truck <laughs> and without... Uh, yeah, without losing any, uh, we've been able to contain them completely. Why would you need to take one out? One of the... Well, at the university, you could use it for teaching purposes. Yeah. Or if we... So we could just take one unit out with two frames in it and then take it to a class so people could see the live bees uh, in the classroom and then still have the exhibit minus one of the units That's here right. for people to see. That's really cool. And um, outside of teaching, like on the bee side of things, um, like will you have to remove some of these to maintain the bees? And why would you have to do that? Uh, if we needed to, if we, it was too congested, had mm -hmm. problems, too much buildup of waste or anything, then we could remove part of it, clean it, and then put it back. 
uh, if we need to deal, hopefully we won't deal with uh, pests, right. we can uh, come up with a way to uh, deal with them. And so, what kind of pests do they get? Uh, the small hive beetles and hopefully never ever a wax moth. Varroa mites. And varroa mites, that's right. So can you tell us a little bit about the West Alabama Beekeeping Association, how to become a member and various certifications that you can get with beekeeping in the state? Absolutely. So we have our local club, West Alabama Beekeepers Association. If you would like to become a member, it's a $10 fee for the entire year. We have a uh, presentation at each of our meetings and all of our members get a copy of that. You uh, just have to sign up at our meeting and, and, and sign up for the membership for that. Uh, and if you're really interested in beekeeping, are there other certifications that you can get? Yes, you can. Uh, on the state level, you can uh, check out alabamabeekeepers.com. On their website, you can see different categories on how to become a master, a certified master beekeeper. It starts on the apprentice level, you go up on journeyman, and then finally you, you get to the masters. So can you just like talk about what people are seeing here? Like um, you can see like the, the yellow comb up there versus like this darker comb, like it gets dark here and then it gets like lighter color here. Like what are we seeing? What's going on there? Okay, we have some darker comb down here. That would be the area where the brood is at. That's where the baby bees are taken care of and where they eventually hatch into baby bees. They so the also, ones that are capped here, like yellow, they have a like a pupa in there that's capped or Exactly. Yeah? Exactly. So they start as an egg, they turn into larvae, and then from that they get capped and they are in the pupa stage from there. So what got you interested in bees? All right. Oh, about nine years ago, I started <laughs> with my first little vegetable garden and I just wanted to get more produce out of it. So I was interested in, in pollinators. And that's when I got my first, first beehive set up in my garden. And it just accelerated from there. I, I, I got hooked. Um, it's really easy to get hooked on beekeeping <laughs> and honeybees. There's just so much to learn and it seems endless, the, this journey of, of beekeeping. There's, there's too much to learn. There's never an end, it seems like. After nine years, I'm still, every day, discovering something new. <laughs> yeah, why should people care about bees? Honeybees are really important for us humans. Um, they play a large role in our, in our food industry. Uh, they are big pollinators for the uh, almond orchards in California, all the way down to the smaller local orchards and just farming in general. We couldn't do we couldn't do the farming on the level that we do today without honeybees. I agree with Selena that bees are incredibly important to us. They save us about 518 billion dollars in the services they provide us every year. So um, we, couldn't, we couldn't live without them. The UA Bee Club also thinks pollinators are incredibly uh, important and so they are actually going to be planting a bee-friendly uh, garden outside of Smith Hall uh, later this summer. So if you're interested in learning about what plants you can put in your yard to help promote pollinators, then stop by our, our live honeybee exhibit and then walk outside and see what plants you can find that you might be interested in putting in your own backyard. I just wanna thank the West Alabama Beekeeping Association. Uh, Vince, Mark, and Selena have been wonderful to work with and uh, I look forward to working with you guys in the future, uh, maintaining our honeybee hive at the Alabama Museum of Natural History. And then finally, we have a new honeybee queen in our museum. So we would uh, like your help in naming our honeybee queen. So there's actually a link um, in the description below. Uh, you can also visit Bama Bug Fest uh, website and there will be a link there as well to help name our honeybee queen. So you can download an image, um, you can color the image of a queen bee if you'd like, um, but most importantly, uh, give us a suggestion for the uh, name of our honeybee queen. Um, 
the all the information and uh, deadlines will be in the links below. And uh, so submit us, submit your honeybee names to us. Uh, we look forward to seeing what you have. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you learned a little bit of something about how a live honeybee hive was uh, created in the Natural History Museum and maybe even a little bit something about honeybees themselves. To support this program, please consider donating to the Alabama Museum of Natural History Program's gift fund by visiting bamabugfest.org and clicking support at the top of the page. Bees are young, you see how they're running? They're running away from the sunlight. Mm -hmm. you, typically from like the time they're born out to day 18 and 21, they're, they're negatively phototactic and they run from the, they run away from the light. And then right before they start becoming foragers, they get attracted to it. You can see here that the bee in the middle that's vibrating is doing the waggle dance and the other bees are intently watching her and Catherine Nordstrom is gonna show you That's in so detail cool. what she is communicating. There are two components to the dance. The waggle, which is the shorter part of the dance, is when the honeybee vibrates its abdomen back and forth very quickly. And the run, which is the longer part of the dance, when the honeybee forms the figure eight type shape. Then, the amount of time that the bee dances for tells the other bees the distance between the hive and the flower of interest. Two, so that's better. 